your perfect day at Hampton Sydney College and welcome to the commencement exercises <laughs> taking place in the 242nd year of our proud history. In just a moment, Reverend Keith Leach, our college chaplain and pastor of College Church, will give the invocation. Following the invocation, will you please remain standing for the singing of our national anthem led by four members of the class of 2017. Reverend Leach. Let us pray. Holy and creating God, we come this morning aware that you are in all places, in this place before we came this day. You are ever present and ever loving. Help us now to feel your presence and to rejoice as your goodness flows into all that we do here this day. May our actions please you and encourage others. May we share your love with all in this time of a long expected ending. And we pray that we would feel your love and strength, that we may confidently rejoice in the new beginnings we see and feel in our hearts. Bless us all with courage, strength, and love for the road ahead. Amen. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright 
Trustees, faculty and staff members, parents and guests, and members of the Hampton Sydney College Class of 2017. Again, welcome to this festive occasion which brings to a culmination four years of hard work and devotion. Devotion to the great cause summarized in our mission to form good men and good citizens. A mission penned by this college's first president in the year of our founding, 1775. Today marks the culmination of this mission for the members of our class of 2017. Our country and the world needed good men and good citizens in 1775, and our country and world need even more today good men and good citizens. You came here as youths, and today you walk across this stage. You receive your diplomas as men. This diploma entitles you to claim the distinction of being a college graduate, but this diploma comes with responsibilities to be a good man and a good citizen, to lead and serve with competence and honor the families you will form, the organizations where you work, the communities you call home, and our larger society. How appropriate that today's celebration takes place on this beautiful Mother's Day. In a very real sense, the work of forming good men and good citizens began long before you arrived at Hampton, Sydney. Please acknowledge now that forming work of your mothers and your fathers who are with us today. And please also acknowledge the dedicated faculty and staff members who have mentored, guided, and supported you over the last four years, as well as the trustees who are joining us today who provide great leadership for our board and this great college. Please welcome now our valedictorian of the class of 2017, Mr. James Lau. James hails from Springfield, Virginia. He served as president of the college's pre-health society. He spent two summers on campus doing collaborative research with our faculty. At final convocation just a few weeks ago, he received the James R. T. Hewitt Biology Award. He is a member of the President's Men. Last spring, he was inducted into Omicron Delta Kappa. He's graduating today with honors in his biology major, and he was also minored in chemistry. Over the course of his four years here, he's earned a 3.99 grade point average. Please congratulate James Lau as he comes to that. Mr. Brett Stevens, President and Mrs. Stimpert, deans, faculty, parents, and graduates. Please allow me to begin by acknowledging three groups of people who have served as the cornerstones of our college experience. First and foremost, I'd like to thank from the bottom of my heart the staff of Hampton Sydney College. Your efforts to support us during this journey have not gone unnoticed. 
Without the excellent omelet making skills of Tia, it would not be far-fetched to assume that my life would have spiraled down a ramen-filled path of questionable decisions. <laughs> I would like to thank the members of Buildings and Grounds who painstakingly maintained this historic and beautiful campus. The staff of Thompson Hospitality, our wellness staff, our librarians, our career services and academic success offices, and every support staff member. Thank you. Secondly, I'd like to thank the faculty on behalf of our class. Your dedication to developing relationships with students both in and out of the classroom is what Ham makes Hampton Sydney truly special. The professors here are not just instructors, but also life mentors and friends. Thank you for holding us to high standards and ensure our success outside of these gates. Last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge our families, the mothers, the fathers, and even our siblings. Without your unconditional love and support, none of us would have ever been able to make it this far. Because of that, I think that it is fitting that we have graduation on Mother's Day. Personally, my mom and grandma have been my emotional anchors throughout these past four years, and I have no doubts that my fellow brothers have also heavily relied upon the support of their mothers as well. Today's festivities can not only be dedicated to us, the graduates, but they must also be dedicated to our moms. Thank you. So, when I was told that I was selected to give the valedictory speech, the first person I contacted was Branch Vincent, who was a valedictorian of 2016. Since Branch is a fraternity brother of mine, I figured he'd love to help me. After all, I have been paying fraternity dues for him to be my friend, right? <laughs> so, I reached out to Branch through a block of heartfelt and scared texts, asking him for advice on how I should approach this speech. I had always viewed him as an older brother and really wanted to pick his brain. However, after a day of me waiting, he simply responded, don't blow it. <laughs> Who would have ever known that the key to successful speech was to just not fail? Branch's so-called advice seemed cheeky at first, but it reminded me of how I ended up attending Hampton City in my time at this wonderful institution. Although I'm being recognized today for my academic accomplishments, my path to and throughout college was riddled with, to say in the best light, learning experiences. During my senior year in high school, I had applied to 10 colleges that offered programs allowing me to directly enter medical school after my undergraduate studies. While I was rejected by many of these schools, I was fortunate to discover Hampton Sydney College and learn that it had a similar pre-medical program. I was eager to attend HSC and take advantage of this opportunity to pursue a career in medicine. However, despite the advantages of this program, the road was not always easy. Currently, I stand before you as valedictorian, but you must know that throughout my four years here, I was forced to encounter failure daily in our science labs. As a general chemistry student, I witnessed firsthand the consequences of adding a strong acid with a base when I carelessly mixed nitric acid with ammonium hydroxide while cleaning my crucibles for an experiment. The results were neither pretty nor clean. Fortunately, my string of failures did not end there, and to this day I'm still learning both inside and outside of the lab. One of the most valuable lessons I learned at Hampton Sydney was that failure is crucial to success. To succeed, we must have the audacity to risk failing and the humility to objectively acknowledge our mistakes or errors, especially when presented with empirical evidence and facts to the contrary. Brothers, I know that each and every one of you have experienced and will experience, again, some sort of failure. Rather than be deterred by your mistakes, I encourage you all to evaluate and embrace them, for acknowledging failure brings you one step closer to success. These formative experiences are where we make the transition to become good men and citizens, but it doesn't end there. We must always strive to be good men and stewards of our country in our daily lives. As Winston Churchill once said, success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. Although addressing your failures is crucial, acknowledging those who have helped you succeed is also important. After all, we are manifestations of those who have invested in us. Personally, I know that I would have never been able to stand before you had it not been for the support of my family, especially my father, Dr. Hargaden, and Dr. Dyfel, 
for they have exhibited confidence in me even during my moments of self-doubt. All of you have at least one individual, whether it be a professor or a roommate at the college, who has influenced you to be your best in a moment of stress or failure. I encourage you to not only thank them, but to also emulate them. As you leave the gates of our beloved alma mater, I urge that you strive to be as positive of an influence on others as our college has been on you. Because Hampton Sydney has helped you develop the tools necessary for success, I have no doubts that you will prosper in whatever field you choose to enter. However, I hope that you will utilize your achievements as a platform to help others. As we grow older, we should endeavor to play the role of a benefactor rather than that of a beneficiary. After all, it is impossible to blow it if we endeavor for the best interests of our country and our planet. Class of 2017, it has been a privilege to stand before you, and I wish you the best of luck outside of these beloved gates. I sincerely wish that I could spend another four years with you all, but I know that the bond we share will last a lifetime. <coughs> Congratulations to all of you. We've made it. Thank you, James, for your comments. Each year at commencement, the college recognizes outstanding achievements through the presentation of a number of awards. Those who have helped to select this year's recipients join me in congratulating them and expressing regret that only a few can receive special public recognition today. The first award is the Gammon Cup. The Gammon Cup, given in memory of Dr. Edgar G. Gammon, a Hampton Sydney graduate of the class of 1905, pastor of College Church from 1917 to 1923, and president of the college from 1939 to 1955, is awarded to the student athlete in the graduating class who has best served the college. Character, scholarship, and athletic ability are considered. Hampton Sydney is blessed with many great student athletes who exemplify honor and integrity. A Christian young man, he entered Hampton Sydney with the top academic scholarship, the President's Award. A thriller on the basketball court, as senior guard forward, this young man earned a career high 29 points to help the Tigers upset host Guilford College at their Old Dominion Athletic Conference game in January. He was named third team all ODAC at the annual ODAC tournament banquet in February of 2017. And during this academic year, he served as a member of the executive branch of student government and on the athletic committee of the faculty. He was selected to appear in Who's Who Among Students in American Universities and Colleges in the fall of 2016. Jacob, Jacob Robert Duncan, please come forward and accept your award. The Anna Carrington Harrison Award, a medal and a cash award given as a memorial to his mother by the late Mr. Fred N. Harrison of Richmond, is awarded to the student who shows the most constructive leadership in a school year. <coughs> this young man was a leader in his community, volunteering at the American Red Cross and Environmental Management Office, just to name two. Here in the top Hampton Sydney Achievement Award, the Dean's Award, honoring his excellent high school career. He was elected as a member of the student court during his sophomore and junior years and was elected by his peers to serve as chairman of the student court during his senior year where he served with distinction. He was selected to appear in Who's Who among students in American universities and colleges in the fall of 2016. He is a young man of the highest standards and moral character. James Allen Mills II, would you please come forward to accept your award?
Phi Beta Kappa Award for Intellectual Excellence in the form of a bronze, bronze medallion and a check for $4,000 was established by Samuel S. Jones, class of 1943, to recognize the intellectual excellence as manifested in outstanding student research. Papers are entered into a competition judged by the faculty members of the Ada of Virginia, Hampton Sydney's chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. This year, the Ada chapter is pleased to present the award to Charles Ashby Netterer for his collection entitled Conflicting Form and Content, Assessing Tertullian's View of Philosophy, written under the supervision of Dr. Jeffrey Vogel, Elliott Associate Professor of Religion. Mr. Netterer, would you please come forward? Algernon Sidney Sullivan Medallion is given annually by the New York Southern Society in honor of its first president, Algernon Sidney Sullivan. The recipient of this award is a member of the graduating class who has distinguished himself for excellence of character and generous service to his fellows. This year, we are pleased to honor two young men to receive this award. The first young man received the 2012 Dean's Award honoring his leadership qualities and excellent work during his high school career. He's a Dean's List student and served as a resident advisor with distinction. He was quick to volunteer for community projects. He received a Madison scholarship in the academic year of 2015 and 16, and he was tapped into Omicron Delta Kappa in the fall of 2015. He served during the 2016-17 academic year on the Human Research Committee for the college. Conrad Wilson Brown, please come forward as one of this year's winners of the Outland Academy Award. This next young man entered Hampton Sydney as a Patrick Henry Scholar on the recommendation of the Honors Council. He's a Dean's List student. He received the David C. Wilson Greek Prize at the 2015 Final Convocation. He successfully completed the Society of 1791 Leadership Program in 2015-16 academic year, and he was tapped into Omicron Delta Kappa in the fall of 2015. He served as a resident advisor as well. He was awarded the President's Award for Academic Excellence in Humanities in 2016 opening convocation and selected to appear in who's who's uh, among students in American universities and colleges in the fall of 2016. One of the finest young men, a true Hampton Sydney gentleman. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in honoring Andrew James Marshall. As we turn our attention now to faculty awards, we'd first like to recognize the years of service of five of our faculty members here at Hampton Sydney. Together, combined, they have all had about 150 years of service to the college. Please stand as I call your name. For 25 years, Professor of History Kenneth D. Lehman and Professor of Biology Alexander Wirth. Professor David D. Lewis has devoted himself to the college for 30 years. David, would you please stand? Thank you, David. And for 35 years of service to the college, Professor Roger M. Barris and Senior Lecturer Victor N. Cavus. Please stand. Thank you all. The first award for the faculty is the Cavill Award. This is given annually to the Hampton Sydney faculty member in recognition of outstanding classroom contribution to the education of Christian young men. The Cavill Award was created by the Robert G. Cavill III and Maud Morgan Cavill Foundation to assist the college in attracting and keeping professors of high ability and integrity. 
Since arriving at the college in 2009, this year's honoree has become widely recognized as one of the most innovative and engaging teachers on campus. Students describe him as energetic and enthusiastic and say that he pushes the boundaries of our skills. Whether creating a video jigsaw laboratory to help students understand competing historical perspectives or crowdfunding a suit of armor to use in his classes or helping students to lay paintball mines in a course on a partisan guerrilla warfare, this professor has tirelessly inspired all of us faculty, students, and alike to imagine afresh what a class can be. In the words of a former student, this class was epic. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to announce the 2017 recipient of the Cavill Award for Outstanding Classroom Teaching goes to Associate Professor of History, Dr. James Frechette. <laughs> Unfortunately, Dr. Frechette couldn't be here this morning. Um, the next award, the Thomas Edward Crawley Award. This diverse, deep, and rich legacy given us by the late Professor Thomas Edward Crawley in his 38-year career as a teacher, scholar, musician, and dean is remembered at Hampton Sydney with an award given annually in Professor Crawley's name to that professor uh, most distinguished for devoted service to the ideals of Hampton Sydney and education of her sons. This year's recipient joined the faculty in 2009 a superb teacher who challenges his students to think cr critically and creatively. He has also proven himself to be tireless and a dedicated member of our community. This year alone, he has served as director of both the Office of Undergraduate Research and the Honors Program, was a member of the Western Culture Committee and an advisor to the Hampton Sydney Journal of the Sciences. When he's not working with students in the lab, he's working to bring our students' work before our community through papers, panels, and symposia. I am pleased to announce this year's winner of the Thomas Edward Crawley Award for Distinguished Service to Elliott Associate Professor of Biology, Mike Waliniak. It's my pleasure now to call upon Mr. Eric Nathaniel McDon McDonald, student body president, to give his remarks and present the senior class award. Thanks, Dr. McDermott. First, I want to say congratulations to my brothers for making it to this special day. Second, happy Mother's Day to all the beautiful mothers in attendance today. With that being said, it's now my pleasure to present the Senior Class Award. The members of the graduating class give this award to members of the college's faculty, administration, or staff whom the eyes of the graduating class has made a lasting impact to the college, its students, and the community throughout our four years. This year, the Senior Class Award is given to two unique members of the Hampton City community who have touched the lives of the class of 2017 in different ways. The first recipient of the award goes to a stimulating individual who has made an enormous contribution to the history department and the well-being of the members of the class of 2017. We all know that Hampton Sydney has a stereotype. People believe that we are one size fit all for privileged, affluent Americans. They think we are all the same. If you met one Hampton Sydney student, you met them all. But they are wrong. We are more than that. Hampton Sydney is not filled with one kind of man, but all kinds of men. We range in different interests, styles, and motivations, yet we all represent the shared core values of a great institution. Our values shine above all else, which leads some people to believe we are all the same. Looking at what Hampton Sydney students have accomplished, where they have gone, and where they are going, we show more, we are more than just a cookie cutter image. Our first senior award is presented to a professor who embodies the idea that the Hampton City man is not based on looks, but rather based on education and character. Alex Abbott, a fellow graduating senior, eloquently said, Hampton Sydney, fairly or unfairly, has a reputation and a stereotype. Dr. Fusetta is one of a kind, as well as a wonderful resource for those of us who do not fit in that stereotype. 
I'm a first generation college student and I'm not into Greek life. He's there for the nerds and the geeks and the guys who aren't the so-called traditional college kids. He plays nerdy board games. He listens to unusual music. He dresses with his own style. He recognizes that he's not a standard college professor and he aids those of us who are not the standard college kids. He makes this place feel like home for guys who don't really have a home and that's an incredibly special and important ability. With that being said, on behalf of the class of 2017, it's my honor to present the Senior Class Award to Dr. James Frisetta. The next recipient of the Senior Class Award is a key member of our school and is renowned for uplifting students in times of trouble and need. She is very involved on our campus and supports every aspect of student life. She is always available and willing to help her brothers when they call on her, and she encourages us to never give up so we can reach our true potential. This woman represents the best characteristics of, of our graduating class. Like the class of 2017, she has unquestionable dedication to the students, the college, and the Hampton City process. In our four years, we have faced hardships, challenges, and changes. She has stood by and supported us as we overcome these obstacles. Through her support, our class has had an active role model embodying the supportive nature of the Hampton Sydney Brotherhood. Her patience, her guidance, and her kindness has changed us from the boys we came in as to the men we are today. Some may see her as just an assistant dean, but we have learned she's much more than that. She's one of the boys. So it's my distinct pleasure to present the second senior class award to my mentor, my coach, and my confidant, Sean White. stage the chairman of the senior gift campaign Connor Lachine good morning president Stimpert on behalf of the class of 2017 as well as the parents friends alumni and fellow students who have generously contributed it is my honor to present this check to the class of 2017 scholarship in honor of Colonel Rucker Snead. The success of this campaign speaks to the character of the senior class here, and we have succeeded again in making a lasting impact as the scholarship will enable young men to join the Hampton Sydney community for years to come. The fashion in which this community has come together in support of the scholarship illuminates the character of Colonel Snead and stands as testimony to the impact he's made on these grounds throughout his tenure at the college. His service is greatly appreciated by all of the students, faculty, and staff, and seniors. As we transition into alumni, we garner the responsibility of continuing our class's tradition of philanthropy. I encourage you all to make an effort in the following years to con continuously support our alma mater and our class scholarship to ensure that the deserving students may share in the opportunities we have had during the our time here at Hampton Sydney College. Thank you.
thank you, class of 2017, for your generosity, and uh, thank you for your uh, giving your well-honored uh, uh, and deserved recognition to Colonel Sneed. I now welcome Captain Reginald Moyes, uh, ROTC program officer in charge, to come forward to commission a U.S. Army officer. Thank you, President Stanford. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Juan Hampton Senior Senior is wearing a different type of regalia today because he's not only graduate, graduating, but also he's to be commissioned as officer in the United States Army. Would Cadet Lawrence step forward, please? <laughs> Where Admiral retired, Frank Rainey will administer the oath of office to Cadet Lawrence. Please raise your right hand, repeat after me. I, Stuart R. Lawrence. I, Stuart R. Lawrence. Having been appointed an officer in the Army of the United States. Having been appointed an officer in the Army of the United States. In the grade of second lieutenant. In the grade of second lieutenant. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies and against all enemies foreign and domestic foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will follow the orders and that I will follow the orders of the officers appointed over me. Of the officers appointed over me. So help me God. So help me God. At this time, I would like to ask Second Lieutenant Lawrence Paris to join us on the stage. For Second Lieutenant Lawrence are his parents, his father Michael, and his mother Sue. Second Lieutenant Lawrence will be attending infantry basic officer course, basic officer leadership course from October 2017 to March 2018 at Fort Benning, Georgia. While at basic officer leadership course, he will find out his follow-on assignment. After completion of basic officer leadership course, he will also attend Ranger School. Lieutenant Lawrence received his first hand salute from Master Sergeant Cook, the Senior Military Science Instructor of the ROTC program. Congratulations, Lieutenant Lawrence, and thank you for your willingness to serve our nation. We salute you and wish you our very best. It's now my honor to introduce today's commencement speaker. One of this college's great presidents, Jonathan Cushing, wrote that our form of government could not be supported without an enlightened community. Two of our country's most important institutions for creating and fostering that enlightened community are our colleges and universities and the news media. So important did our country's founder consider a free and open press that in the very first year of our new government, in their very first amendments to our new constitution, they enshrined freedoms of speech and public discourse. 
One of the great paradoxes of our current age is that even though we now have many media offering us access to news 24 hours a day and seven days a week, we do not necessarily have better news. More discourse has not guaranteed better discourse. It's important to acknowledge that combativeness, personal attacks, and media bias are not new and did not start with our most recent presidential campaign. But today our society seems more likely than ever to be satisfied with the most cursory of analyses. We are all too eager to agree with those who pander to our preconceived notions and prejudices, and we quickly become prickly when our worldview is challenged. We run the risk of being caught up in a vicious cycle of media outlets catering to their audience's preconceived notions, which only further reinforces those preconceived notions, making us more convinced of the rightness of our own point of view and less open and willing to learn from others' perspectives. While you graduating seniors have learned much during these past four years, my most fervent hope is that you have acquired not only rhetorical skill and eloquence, but also the courage to go where reasoning and critical thought lead. Our commencement speaker today is an exemplar for you and for all of us. He is not only a thoughtful and eloquent writer and commentator, but his writing exemplifies both the discipline of a first grade intellect and the courage to go where reason leads and the discipline that, uh, of that first rate intellect. Brett Stevens is an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. Before, before moving to the Times just last month, he was deputy editorial page editor for the Wall Street Journal and wrote that paper's Global View column for many years. For that writing, he won the Pulitzer Prize in 2013. He has also served as the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post. He received his undergraduate education from the University of Chicago, and he earned a master's degree from the London School of Economics. We are delighted that he agreed to serve as our commencement speaker. Mr. Stevens, we are eager to be challenged by your remarks. President Stimper, Provost Stevens, Dean Sabatini, Dean McDermott, Lieutenant Lawrence, members of the Board of Trustees, distinguished faculty, family and friends, and above all, gentlemen of the class of 2017. Congratulations. Very soon, you will hold in your hands the diploma of a great and storied college. A diploma that is going to open door after door in your life. Very soon, you will join the ranks of alumni that include an American president, countless senators, congressmen, cabinet secretaries, military commanders, and business leaders, and arguably Stephen Colbert. <laughs> Very soon, you will make good on the faith, pride, investment, and immense effort of your teachers, your coaches, your families, and above all, your moms. And I trust you won't forget to wish yours a very happy Mother's Day. And finally, very soon, you'll be gone from this gorgeous campus this nurturing, stimulating, protective place, a place that, in a manner of speaking, has been your safe space for these past few years. So let me ask you directly, are you ready, really ready, to leave this safe space? Are you? I've been thinking a lot about safe spaces lately. For those of you with the good fortune never to have heard the term, a safe space is not, as you may suppose, a concrete reinforced room where you can ride out a tornado. It isn't a bulletproof car either. Instead, a safe space denotes a place, usually on campus, where like-minded people often sharing the same race, gender, religion, sexual orientation, or political outlook, 
can spend time together without having to encounter the expression of any ideas or opinions with which they do not agree. Here is an example. In the fall of 2014, a student at Brown University got wind that her school was going to host a debate between two women, one a feminist and the other a libertarian, on the subject of campus sexual assault. The student feared that exposure to such a debate could be, and I quote, damaging to people in the audience, some of whom might find their experiences of sexual assault, quote, invalidated by what the debaters might have to say. And so the student organized a safe space. As described by the essayist Judith Shulovitz in the New York Times, the space was a room, I quote again, equipped with cookies, coloring books, bubbles, Play-Doh, calming music, pillows, blankets, and a video of frolicking puppies, as well as students and staff members trained to deal with trauma. Now, that sounds harmless enough, and if such safe spaces offer comfort to the people who used it, well, so much the better. But the story of safe spaces doesn't end there, unfortunately. As Shulovitz noted in her essay, quote, once you designate some spaces as safe, you imply that the rest are unsafe. It follows that they should be made safer. That is an important insight. It shows how easily an impulse to shield and protect the vulnerable quickly becomes a desire and then a demand to impose a particular concept of safety on others, whether they want it or not. After all, if a college or university should accept the principle of a, sa of a safe space in a single designated room, why should that same principle not extend to the classroom, the lecture hall, dormitories, college newspapers, chat rooms, social media, and so on? If we want to accommodate the sensitivities of our fellow students, shouldn't that accommodation extend not only to what we say around them, but also to what we say anywhere, or what we allow to be said anywhere. And if it is not okay to say certain things anywhere, should we even think them? Wouldn't we be better off if the ideas that can hurt people's feelings or trigger their anxieties never even popped into our heads in the first place? I'm sorry to say that the process I'm describing, or Orwellian though it seems to me, in that it turns supposed victims into moral bullies, is increasingly becoming a dominant fact of life on colleges and universities across America. In the name of being safe, it is becoming increasingly difficult for campus administrators to guarantee the physical safety of controversial visiting speakers. In the name of being safe, the job security of professors and administrators has been put at increasing risk lest they espouse, teach, or merely fail to denounce a point of view that contradicts the political certitudes of the moment. In the name of being safe, students with traditional religious values or conservative political views now feel decidedly unsafe about expressing their views on campus. And in the name of being safe, we are gravely jeopardizing the central task of any serious liberal education, which is not, or not merely, the transmission of knowledge. It is, rather, the cultivation of a certain kind of spirit, a passion for inquiry, an insistence on asking hard questions and challenging received wisdom a reveling in argument, a productive tension between self-confidence and self-doubt, a robust faith in the ultimate attainability of truth, and a humble acceptance that our understanding of the truth will almost always be something less than complete. This is what education is, or ought to be, about. 
This is how we educate young men and women toward the moral and political responsibilities of democratic self-rule. This is how we lay the conditions for scientific and social progress. This is how we lay sturdy foundations for a truly civil society. Thomas Jefferson said it best in his first inaugural address. Error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it. Let me repeat that so that you, so that you may commit his words to memory. Error of opinion may be tolerated where reason is left free to combat it. When you can't speak freely, sooner or later, it becomes difficult to think clearly. God did not give you a mouth in order to keep it shut. And the Constitution does not include a Bill of Rights so that we may refrain from exercising our rights. This should be a standard for every free society and for every great college and university. Now, from everything that I have read about Hampton Sydney, this is the education that you have received here. I hope you use it well, but I need to level with you. You will be facing an uphill battle. Across the country, hundreds of thousands of your peers are also celebrating their commencements, receiving their diplomas, starting out in the world. But not all of their educations have been liberal in the truest sense of the word. Instead of being educated to a cultured skepticism, too many have been educated to fervent certitude. Instead of embracing, or at least respecting, heterodox or unsettling ideas, they prefer to retreat into settled convictions. Instead of wanting to engage controversial discussions, they just as soon shut them down. And instead of wanting to emerge at last from the cocoons of their safe spaces, they want to extend the domain of those spaces into the next stages of their lives. Now don't get me wrong, the they in those sentences consists, for the most part, of nice, well-intentioned, uh, well-intentioned, intelligent, hard-working, and often high-achieving people. They just happen to know that truth and virtue is on their side. They are convinced that any difference of opinion on matters they hold dear isn't simply an error of reasoning, but an affront to human decency. They believe they are entitled to denounce the people with whom they disagree as knavish ignoramuses. And they believe that it is imperative to keep a very safe distance between themselves and the ideas that so disturb them. Today, we live in a world that makes it easy to continue inhabiting these safe spaces. Above all, when it comes to politics, public policy, and ideology. On social media, you follow, share, and retweet the people you agree with while you ignore, unfriend, remove, or block those you don't. If you're a conservative news junkie, Fox News is your safe space, even if you'd probably never call it that. You can watch it for days, indeed weeks, months, and years, on end without ever encountering a persuasively contrary opinion, at least one that isn't instantly derided as unworthy of serious consideration. And if you're a liberal, it's the same story on MSNBC. When you open the op-ed pages of a newspaper, you'll turn first to the columnist with whom you already know you're likely to agree, so that you can see your already correct opinions repeated and ratified once more. As for the writers with whom you disagree, whether it's Krugman or Stevens, Kristoff or Krauthammer, you've already concluded that they're idiots or liars, so you'll either skip over them or read them with smirking disdain. And so it goes. 
we all agree that the system of checks and balances is a good idea for a well-functioning and prudent government. But where are the checks and balances in our own thinking? The check that whispers, hey, you could be wrong. The balance that suggests, hey, there's another way of thinking about it. This is what I fear we are at risk of losing in America today. Too many of our schools are producing students who have never learned properly to engage, understand, or accept an alternative point of view. Too many of our citizens only want to hear from the people they agree with and who will never change their minds about a thing. And too many of our media outlets see no problem in catering exclusively to these increasingly narrow and illiberal tastes. We worry a lot these days about political polarization and the unpleasant choices such polarization leaves us, leaves us with as citizens at the ballot box and its effects on what used to be our common values, our shared sense of nationhood. What we fail to recognize is that this polarization is a result of us getting exactly what we want only to rue the consequences. A month ago, I chose to do my small part in trying to swim against this particular current. After 16 productive and happy years as a conservative writer with a staunchly conservative editorial page of the Wall Street Journal, I decided to switch teams to the, most liberal, to the mostly liberal editorial pages of the New York Times. In case you're wondering, my opinions are just as conservative, reactionary, and antediluvian as they've always been. My salary is pretty much the same. And no, I wasn't pushed out of my last job. But I did have a gnawing sense that it was time to stop talking to my own side, preaching to my own choir. I wanted to write for an audience that might, be, that might not be wholly receptive, even openly hostile, to what I have to say. In short, I thought it was time to leave my own safe space, to take the gamble that I might be able to sway readers not initially inclined to agree with me, and to accept the possibility that they, in turn, might sway me. Has it been fun? Yes. Has it been rough? A bit. Has it been worth it? Ask me in a few years. But I'm optimistic. So here's my advice to you. Get out of your own safe spaces. Define what, your, define what your intellectual comfort zone is and leave it. Enhance your tolerance for discordant voices. Narrow your criteria for what's beyond the pale. <laughs> Read the authors or watch the talking heads you don't agree with. Treat your disagreements with them as a wedding stone to sharpen your own arguments. Resist the temptation to call people names. By all means, master the art of being pugnacious in argument, but as a pugnacious dialogian, not as a petulant didact. Go beyond that. Befriend your intellectual adversaries. Assume that they're smart, that their motives are honorable, and that they are your fellow travelers in a quest for better understanding a common set of challenges. Master the civilized art of agreeable disagreement. Try to remember that words are not weapons, and that politics is not warfare, and that debate is not a death sport. Learn that in politics, no less than in marriage, it's a bad idea to go to bed angry with each other. Have an argument and then have a drink together. Members of the class of 2017, do not close your ears to, oppose, to opposing points of view. Otherwise, you cannot learn. Do not foreclose the possibility that you might change your mind. Otherwise, you cannot grow. Do not lose sight of the fact that you are not in possession of the whole and only truth. 
Otherwise, you will fail to notice your mistakes and so suffer their consequences. Above all, do not forget that the world would be a duller and darker place if everyone thought as you did and if all our thoughts were safe ones and if there were nothing to bestir our minds and inflame our senses and rouse our consciences and churn the warm but too placid waters in which we swim at our own peril. Safe spaces, physical and intellectual, are for children. You are now grown men. If your diplomas mean anything, it's that it is time you leave those spaces behind forever. Thank you and congratulations. Much, Mr. Stevens. I'd like to now welcome Mr. M. Peebles Harrison, Hampton Sydney College Class of 1989 and Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Hampton Sydney College to make an important announcement. As Chairman of the Board of Trustees and in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I confer upon the President of Hampton Sydney College the authority to award the degrees authorized by the Board of Trustees. Aren't you glad he did that? We will now confer the honorary degrees. President Gray, will you please come and stand at my right while I read a citation. Hollins University holds a special place in the hearts and minds of many Hampton Sydney College students and alumni. It is an institution as dedicated to the educational needs of young women as Hampton Sydney is to the educational needs of young men. Also, as an assembly of bright, intelligent, and good-natured young women, Hollins University has been a popular destination for Hampton Sydney students since Hollins' founding in 1824. Educated at Vanderbilt University and at North Texas State University, Nancy Gray emerged as a leader in higher education, serving as president of Converse College in South Carolina before becoming Holland University's 11th president in 2005. After increasing the size of the university's student body, completing the university's largest ever capital campaign, renovating many university buildings, introducing new programs, and increasing the number of student scholarships, all while eliminating the university's debt, she announced her retirement at the end of this academic year. Beyond her influence in higher education, she has served on the boards of numerous institutions, including colleges, seminaries, theaters, and orchestras. Now, therefore, in recognition of your contributions to the life of the mind, distinguished leadership of Hollins University and a strong commitment to public service by the authority invested in me by the trustees of Hampton Sydney College and under the laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I admit you to the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with the rights, responsibilities, privileges there, thereunto appertaining, and in token of which I give you this diploma and you will be hooded with the degree appropriate to this degree. <laughs> Mr. Stevens, would you also please come forward and stand at my right while I read the citation? Distilling information, formulating one's opinions, and capturing those opinions in the written word is something we both teach and celebrate at Hampton City College. Now a columnist and associate editor for the New York Times, Brett Stevens was previously the writer of the Global View column at the Wall Street Journal, where his incisive commentary earned him the Pulitzer Prize in 2013. His own global view is undoubtedly influenced by experiences growing up in New York, Mexico City, 
studying in Chicago and London, and working in Brussels, Jerusalem, and New York City. His book, American Retreat, the New Isolationism and the Coming Global Disorder makes a case for American intervention around the globe, drawing praise from Democrats and Republicans alike. His perspectives on topics in American foreign policy and domestic politics have forced his readers to take a long, hard look at their own perspectives on issues of great importance. In an age of 24-hour cable news and social media, he is among an increasingly rare group less a provocateur and more a propagator of inquiry, wit, ideas, and most of all, reason. Now, therefore, in recognition of your contributions to the life of the mind, a distinguished commitment to public service, by the authority vested in me by the trustees of Hampton Sydney College and under the laws of the Commonwealth of Virginia, I admit you to the degree Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa with the rights, privileges, and responsibilities thereunto appertaining, in token of which I give you this diploma, and you will be hooded with the hood appropriate to this degree. We will now award the degrees to the graduates of the class of 2017. Yeah. Parents, there is a space here to the right of the stage where you may take a picture of your son receiving a diploma. Mr. Dr. McDermott? Will the candidates for the degrees of Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Science please rise? <laughs> President Stimper, <laughs> I have the honor of presenting these candidates, all of whom have fulfilled the requirements for the degree of Bachelor of Arts or the degree of Bachelor of Science. I was all ready to take my picture with you. <laughs> okay. By the powers vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Hampton Sydney College and by the Commonwealth of Virginia, I confer upon you the degree of Bachelor of Arts or the degree Bachelor of Science. For the degree of Bachelor of Arts, will the graduates please come forward as your name is called? Alexander Vincent Abbott, summa cum laude. Ryan Scott Anger. Jared Anthony Artson. Brennan Lewis Oust. Thomas Clay Bales. Hot five ninety, baby! Ryan Scott Beaver, cum laude. Ramon Hatib Berhe, cum laude. Michael Lawrence Robert Bowling. Yay, Michael! Good job! Benjamin Douglas Briggs. Trey Kadrick Briggs. <laughs> Nicholas Parker Browning, summa cum laude.
John Ford Burke. Harrison Steele Burkett. Joel Collins Burley. Javon DeAndre Burton. James Andrew Carlton Jr. Lucien Maurice Cassier. Bradley Jordan Chester Magna Cum Laude. Spencer Ryan Cowell. Lewis Darden Trent Copeland. Owen Michael Costello. Michael Abilio Credo. <laughs> Charles Peyton Crowder. Hi, <laughs> Miles Taylor C. Cutchen. William Andrew Dickerson. <laughs> Davis Cole Dubois. <laughs> Spencer Patrick Dixon. Jacob Robert Duncan. James Wallace Eagle. Rollins Whitley Edwards. Enrique Elizondo. <laughs> Garrett Rembert Faney. <laughs> Nelson Maynard Fisher the second. <laughs> Michael Edward Flanagan Cum Laude. <laughs> David Griffith Cleanor. <laughs> Daniel Robert Fogelman. <laughs> Eric Monroe Foster, Joseph Matthew Fox the second, Lucas Stephen Pusey. Garrett Wicks Gately, Cum Laude.
John Christopher Gauss Jr., cum laude. Mark Thomas Gibbs. Robert Powers Gilbertson, summa cum laude, senior fellow in government and history. Davis Addison Gills. Dylan Henderson Gonzalez. Marcus Lee Goodman. Alex James Guo. Jacob David Hargrove. Samuel Edward Hatcher. <laughs> Taylor Michael Hebner. <laughs> Nicholas John Hillier. <laughs> Daniel Alfred Hoffler, Jr. <laughs> Davis Allen Horrible. Let's go, Kuwa! <laughs> Jeffrey Michael Jenke. Jay Shamar Jamerson. <laughs> Hacker Richmond Jennings. John Gregory Jones Jr. Summa cum laude. <laughs> Christopher Ryan Jones. Michael Joel Kaufman. Trent Sidner Kearns Jr. Emily McLeod Klein, cum laude, whose diploma is given by her father, Dr. David Klein. Demetrios Koulianos, summa cum laude. <laughs> Tyler James Langhorn. <laughs> Stuart Reese Lawrence, summa cum laude, senior fellow in foreign affairs and history. Logan Durwood Leathers the third. <laughs> Mark Albert Lee. <laughs> Parker Lewis Levy. <laughs> Trent
Travis Reed Lincolnhoger. Thomas Andrew Robertson Loving. Alejandro Luna. Patrick Daniel Lewis, cum laude. Andrew John Madison, summa cum laude. Seamus Ryan McGee. Ryan Christopher Mayen. <laughs> Turner Lee Makepeace. Magna Cum Laude. John Benedict Tuttle March. Joseph Franklin Markley the third. Let's go, Frank! Andrew James Marshall, Summa Cum Laude. Carter Dabney Mason, cum laude. Carter Mason. <laughs> Bailey John Meower. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Bailey! <laughs> Eric Nathaniel McDonald. Yeah. Cameron Joseph McFarland. <laughs> Kyle Douglas McClellan. <laughs> Matthew Charles Metheny. <laughs> Zachary Boyd Vixovic. Yeah. <laughs> James Allen Mills the second. <laughs> Caleb Blair Mize. Edgar Murray Moore, the third. <laughs> Maxwell James Morgan, summa cum laude. Matthew Duncan Morris. Yes, go! William Chamberlain Mott the third. Let's go, Bill! Yeah. Yeah, Bill. Thomas Anthony Patrick Murphy. Matthew Chubek Nationalis. Charles Ashby Netterer, summa cum laude, honors in religion. Acre, Edward Nicholson III. Yeah, Robert Benjamin Nofsinger.
Connor Anthony O'Hare. <laughs> Jordan Granville Park. Andrew Joseph Parker. Ryan Taylor Peavy. Robert Townsend Pettit. Ryan Mason John Phipps. Brock Lucas Planiga. Steve Dino Ponce. Jeffrey Ladd Potter. What up, four eight? Ryan Redding Quick. One eight. Alexander Javante Redick. John Robert Reagan Jr. Brandon Thomas Riley. Jacob Lawrence Richardson. Sean Patrick Riley II, cum laude. Robert Cecil Rittenhouse III. Gray Thomas Ritter. Paul Ryan Robertson. <laughs> Edward Young Robinson, whose diploma is being presented by his mother, Dr. Serena Thornton. Rashad Rudd. Miles Christopher Sadler. Hamden Austin C. Frank Andrew Sexton, cum laude. Matthew Clark Sheffield. Alexander Lee Simmons. Christopher Trent Singleton, cum laude. William Hooper Smith. Walker Whalen Smithson. Clayton Randolph Sora. Starnes. <laughs> 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 
Tristan Wilder Stigall. Austin Steven, Magna Cum Laude. <laughs> Nicholas Michael Sullivan. <laughs> Joseph Matthew Sutphin. Matthew Robert Sidner. Yes, Jackson Harris Trevener. <laughs> Frederick Marshall Todman. <laughs> Kyle Gray Tomlin, cum laude. Kevin Austin Trapp. Samuel Thomas Travis. Kyle Sterling Tucker. Randolph Twitty the third. George Litz Van Dyke, summa cum laude. Jonathan Hayes Van Dyke, summa cum laude. Jack William. Grayson Volker. <laughs> Tyler Madison Walton. <laughs> James Ivy Warren the Fourth. <laughs> Alexander Joseph Washburn. <laughs> Romus Wilson White, magna cum laude. <laughs> Michael Joseph White Jr., cum laude. Samuel Webb Weitzel. <laughs> Christian Valente Wilder. <laughs> Kevin Anthony Willem. Arthur Williams. <laughs> Marcus Jacob Williams. Christopher Michael Williams Morales, cum laude. <laughs> Jamal Carrington Wooldridge. <laughs> Patrick Ryan, Ryan Woolwine. Gregory Charles Wooten. Mason Richard Wright. William Taylor C. 
Ziegler, Jr. For the degrees of Bachelor of Science, will the graduates please come forward as your name is called? <laughs> Daryl Courtney Bynes, Jr., Cum Laude, Honors of Biology. <laughs> Joseph Fletcher Forum. <laughs> Brant Derwent Boucher, Summa Cum Laude. Blake Thomas Brown, cum laude. <laughs> Conrad Wilson Brown, summa cum laude, honors of chemistry. Grant Poston Brown. Jonathan Hal Bryson, magna cum laude. Robert Newton Bugby. Zachary Ryan Carter, magna cum laude. Joshua Vance Chamberlain, magna cum laude, honors in biology, honors in chemistry. <laughs> Alex Scott Crabtree, summa cum laude. <laughs> Ronald Justin Davis. Paul Taswell Deldana. William Reed Eccles, Magna Cum Laude. Pasquale Joseph Graziosi. Alexander Philip Greer. <laughs> Gannon Stewart Griffin. <laughs> Jason Richard Hallow, Honors of Chemistry. <laughs> Trevor James Hardwell. Connor Michael Carney Robert George Kirby the third summa cum laude Ryan Allen Cluck James Hua Lau, summa cum laude, honors in biology. Zachary Stephen Martin, magna cum laude. Paul. Taylor Matthews, Jr. Harrison James McNabb, cum laude. Henry James Mesereau, cum laude.
Jonathan William Miller. John Trailer Nichols Jr. Tyler Harrison Reeks, Honors in Biology. Ruben Pascal Retnam, Summa Cum Laude. Stephen Kyle Ruing. Samuel Edward Sheffield, magna cum laude. Lucas Robert Staten. Zachary Paul Tabrani. Harris Lee Thomas. Mitchell Harper Thomas, magna cum laude. Joseph Anthony Tyler, cum laude. Marshall Thomas Vineyard III, cum laude. Dustin Bruce Wiles, summa cum laude. Aaron J. Willie. William Robert Zeckman. John Michael Zoab. We honor also today several additional students who will soon complete their re uh, requirements for their bachelor's degrees. Will you please come forward as your names are called? Brandon Allen Milton Briscoe. Mitchell Andrew Connolly. Christopher Charles Dalian. Thomas Coulter Eastman. Austin Blake Ellis. Nicholas Fisk Fox. Carson Christian Gregory. Raymond James Hart III. Noah Einer Holt. Connor Edmund Lachine. Mitchell Hughes McCollum. David P. McKinney. Ryan Christopher Mitchell. Tanner Roberts Mullins. Nicholas Reed Ozzy. Luke 
Luke Wade Harris. Houston Lazenby Porter. Christian Lyle Schultz. George Crawford Scott the Fourth. Michael Paul Willis. Winfield Grant Willis. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the presentation of diplomas. Please be seated. In considering what charge I might give to you brothers who I've come to know and admire so much during this past year, I can think of no better message than excerpts from a speech by the late Admiral Hyman Rickover. I just learned last night that Admiral Rickover gave a commencement address here on a very steamy May uh, 1981 in a Kirby field house. Uh, listen to these words. We should value the faculty of knowing what we ought to do and having the will to do it. Knowing is easy. It is the doing that is difficult. The critical issue is not what we know, but what we do with what we know. The great end of life is not knowledge, but action. To seek and accept responsibility, to persevere, to be committed to excellence, to be creative and courageous, to be unrelenting in the pursuit of intellectual development, to maintain high standards of ethics and morality, and to bring these basic principles of existence to bear through active participation in life. These are some of my ideas on the goals that must be met to achieve meaning and purpose in life. What a great charge for you as you move on from this college that has been preparing leaders in every century of this nation's history. I now welcome Dr. Lee King, Hampton City Class of 1994 and Vice President for Institutional Advancement. Members of the Class of 2017, I am here to officially welcome you as members of the Hampton Sydney College Alumni Association. Congratulations on your accomplishment and welcome to the Alumni Brotherhood. You join a vast network of nearly 10,000 Hampton Sydney men who carry with them the ideals of being a good man and a good citizen in their families, their careers, and in their civic responsibilities. As you leave these gates to begin your lives as Hampton Sydney alumni, I encourage you to follow these words of John Wesley. They are appropriately fitting for a good man and a good citizen. Indeed, they're appropriately fitting for us all. Listen to John Wesley's words. Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Do good, Hampton Sydney men, and make your alma mater proud with your accomplishments. I have just a few more announcements before we conclude our festivities today. Members of the class of 2017, there will be a champagne toast in your honor immediately following the ceremony that champagne toast is immediately following the ceremony on the east patio of the new brown student center we hope to see you there 
parents and families following the recessional this morning please make your way to the commencement luncheon located on Shawgrove Point behind Subtle Hall where your sons while your sons are enjoying the senior toast I invite forward now our seniors who are going to lead us in the singing of the college hymn and I ask that you please now for the singing for stand for the singing of the hymn After the hymn, the hymn will be followed by the benediction, and we ask members of the audience to remain standing in place for the recessional by the platform party, faculty, and members of the class of 2017. Here's to old Hampton Sydney, the garnet and the gray, and her sons by the Believing that this day wisdom is indeed vindicated by all her children, go out into the world following the wisdom of the ages, humbling yourselves in service and in love. Live this day and indeed all the years you given to you honorably. Live guided by the light of justice, the strength of truth, and the power of love. Mind all that you have learned in this place, even as you go to learn more. Go out with God's blessing and be good people and good citizens, that you might be a blessing to others, not only this day, but forevermore. Amen. Amen.
Romeo. Job? Job? Job?